Seekers. I'm going to redo that Good, the Bad, and the Ugly one day. This is just a test version I did. I'm moving house. Uh, today is a big day, uh, and so I didn't have a chance to make a video. But this is an old video I made about Buddhist views on abortion. I made it three years ago or so. And since there's all this crosstalk I'm seeing on the news about Roe versus Wade, I thought it might be kind of topical. But it is three years old, so um, there you go. And it's uh, about some research I did about Buddhist views on abortion three years ago. So here you go. In the last couple of weeks, or a few weeks, there have been some bills that have come out that have been pretty controversial. There was one bill in the state of Virginia where they want to extend the ability to have an abortion up until the third trimester. And I know there's all sorts of caveats and stuff, but it's, a, you know, it's one of the longest uh, length bills right to the end of pregnancy. Meanwhile, on the other end, in Ohio, there's a bill that wants to restrict abortion so that you can't have an abortion after a fetal heartbeat has been detected. So that's going all the way on the other end. And of course, there are people either freaking out or elated that Roe versus Wade might be overturned by a, a Supreme Court with a conservative majority. So all of this got me thinking about why is abortion such a hot-button issue in the United States of America? Because I lived in Japan for 11 years, as a lot of you know, and abortion is, is not an issue there. I can't think of a single time there was an abortion rally that I was aware of. Now, I've read a little bit lately, and I've found out they do happen, but they, they don't even get covered in the news. Nobody really talks about abortion. It's not a big issue, but it is a huge issue in the United States. So why is this? Well, I addressed this a little bit in my book Sex, Sin, and Zen, but that was published uh, several years ago, and I've learned quite a bit more since then. I don't think I wrote anything incorrect in Sex, Sin, and Zen. I've just got more information now, and I kind of like to talk about that here while everybody's kind of thinking about the subject of abortion in America. I just finished reading this very interesting book called Liquid Life, Abortion and Buddhism in Japan by William R. Lafleur. I bought this at a Goodwill for $2. It's the only book I know that's completely solely devoted to a detailed examination of this phenomenon. Now, of course, one huge difference between Japan and the United States is that in the United States, the majority religion is Christianity, and in Japan, the majority religion is Buddhism. Now, this isn't the only reason for the difference in their attitudes towards abortion, and William Lefer points out a few other factors, but it is a major factor, and it's the one I'd like to talk about in this video. Christians believe that each of us has a soul, and usually in Christian doctrine, the nature of the soul isn't examined in great detail, but the Hindus have a very similar doctrine uh, called the Atman, which does go into more detail, and, and since they're so similar, I think we can compare the two, or we can kind of you know, combine the two into one. The Atman theory has it that the true person is a kind of um, immaterial something that that enters the body at a certain point and then uses the body as a vehicle to do what it wants in the material world. Well, the Buddha rejected this idea. He said that what human beings are is a combination of five elements, form, feeling, perceptions, impulses, and consciousness, the skandhas, they're called in Buddhism. And that these skandhas come together for a certain period of time or, or a certain period of, of activity, let's say, maybe time is quite uh, a little nebulous there. And then they come apart after a while or recombine and, and do all sorts of things, just like in a lava lamp or something. Uh, but it's not an individual soul that sort of you know, comes from body to body, or an individual soul that is created by God and then shoved into a body at a certain point. American lawmakers are really interested in defining exactly when human life begins. It seems to me that the underlying assumption is that it's a sudden event, like there is a point at which you go from 100% nothing to do with a human life to bang, human life 100%. And defining exactly where that sudden event 
is is what people are obsessed about and so some people want to say that that sudden event happens at exactly the 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 nanosecond that the sperm enters the egg then you've got a human life bang 100 percent some people want to delay it all the way to the point where the umbilical cord is cut and then only then do you have a human life Buddhists tend to look at it differently, and when I say Buddhists, I'm not necessarily including myself in this. I'm kind of giving you the general understanding that's sort of in the air about this. And they, they look at it as a gradual becoming. So these five skandhas gradually transfer from the unseen realm of who knows what, because we can't see it, into our realm. And this happens by degrees. And it is a process that begins before birth happens and isn't complete until long after the person has been alive. Sometimes they, they think of it as taking 20 years to, to happen. So that until the person is 20 years old, they haven't become fully human. So rather than a bang, sudden human is there, they think of it as a, as a gradual process. And there is a diagram in William Lafer's book that shows this, and you can see that diagram if you look at the blog that I put up about this, and I'll give you a link below to where that can be found. In addition to this, there's a general understanding or notion that the exit from this life begins while you're still alive, when you're in your old age, and is completed sometime after you die. So, so there's an idea that, that things like Alzheimer's or senility or general, you know, the fading of the memory and such, like even if it's not Alzheimer's, is evidence of the person kind of withdrawing from, from life uh, before life has actually even ended. Another major difference between how abortion is viewed and understood in Japan as in contrast to, to America and most of the West is the Japanese have a specific ritual for commemorating or honoring the, the lost child, which they call Mizuko, which literally means water child. So these rituals are intended to pacify both the bereaved parents and the, the child itself when it returns to the unseen realm. They often refer to this process of, of abortion as a returning of the life back to where it came from. So there isn't this idea that it's necessarily ending the life. The life is seen as continuing, but continuing somewhere else. Again, I, I tend to take a skeptical view of this personally, and that, that's sort of part and parcel of being a Zen Buddhist rather than one of these other kinds of Buddhists, because Zen Buddhists tend to look at these things skeptically, but it's in the air, and I, I think it's possible, certainly, but I'm not putting my, you know, like rubber stamp on, like, I believe this is what, what really happens. So there's a ritual called Kuyo, which is intended to, to pacify this Mizuko, this water child, the aborted child, on its way back to where it came from. Unfortunately, this Mizuko Kuyo, which is the ritual, has become big business in Japan in the last few years. The book kind of cites the 1970s as the beginning of when it became a huge business, where there are temples who, some of them do nothing but Mizuko Kuyo these abortion rituals and they don't even really offer the normal services of, of a Buddhist temple. This is because in Japan often abortion is seen as a form of birth control. I mean obviously in, in some sense it is a form of birth control, right? But, but uh, you know as the pill, condoms, or an abortion, that's birth control. So it's often taken I, I think much too lightly. So this has led to a kind of a boom in abortions which has led to a boom in these Mizukoku Yo temples which forces other temples like more mainstream legitimate Buddhist temples to also offer them because if if they can't compete with the competition, they're going to lose out. Even though the Buddhist priests and, and monks and such like, and nuns in those temples might not really be in favor of abortion in principle. Because the problem for Buddhists when it comes to abortion is the first Buddhist precept is do not take life, do not kill. 
And whether the Mizuko is a fully formed human or not, it's seen as a life, and a lot of Buddhists think that even taking the life of an animal or, or an insect in, when it's not necessary is, is not a good thing to do. But Buddhists don't tend to get very hot under the collar, let's say, uh, about these matters because most Buddhist priests, the Japanese Buddhist priests that they talk about in the book, they're more interested in consoling the bereaved than in scolding them for their past actions, and they'll kind of let the the thing slide because a violation of the precepts is not seen quite the same as a sin in Christianity. It's, it's maybe a mistake that you atone for, but it's not seen as being some kind of uh, crime against God. Another thing that makes this different is that Buddhism itself is not very concerned with procreation or creation itself. I, I mean, there is no agreed-upon creation myth in Buddhism, and even the very idea of creation in a universal cosmological sort of sense is seen by many Buddhists, especially in the Zen sect, as being a, a mistake in understanding of the nature of the universe and the nature of time itself. So the idea of a creation of a human life is also seen as, as something very different. The human life isn't created at the moment of conception or at the moment of birth. The human life or the life, the life force, the five skandhas before they become a human, are seen as existing prior to and after the, the lifetime of the being as a human. So you don't have this idea of, of, of ending something, of terminating something, so much as moving something from one realm to another, which, as I said, since it involves killing, is seen as a violation of the precepts anyway. But Buddhism started out as a practice of celibate people who had left home and family. So matters of family and children were never of great concern to the early Buddhists. And when Buddhism became more you know, family friendly, as it were, it was still kind of the, these matters of family and procreation and, and these kind of things were left to other parts of society to deal with. Marriage, for example, you didn't have Buddhist weddings until quite recently because Buddhists weren't interested in, in getting involved in the wedding business, except now they are, some, some places anyway. But this is not the main concern of Buddhists. So even if they see abortion as being a violation of the precepts, it's not something they are going to be ov overly concerned with, the way, for example, Catholic uh, clergy is extremely concerned with, and a lot of Protestant clergy is extremely concerned with, because these religions are much more involved in the, in the family and procreation process, and, and, and their mythology has a lot more to do with that. Personally, if you want to know my own point of view, the thing that bothers me the most about the American approach is the total lack of any acknowledgement of ambiguity on either side. So you have the anti-abortion side who say it's unambiguously a human life and this is unambiguously murder. And then you have the other side, the, the pro-choice side, which says this is unambiguously nothing more than a surgical procedure, and it's nothing more than a clump of cells, so we don't have to have any moral ambiguity over this. Now, I'm pretty much pro-choice, because I think that ultimately, whatever laws are passed, only the pregnant person is going to make the ultimate decision whether to abort or not abort. And that being the case, I think it's better that abortion be safe and legal than, than unsafe and illegal. So I would have to kind of come down on the pro-choice side. But I am kind of horrified by the way the pro-choice side has gone recently, and I'm kind of a little bit reluctant to associate with them because they take such a radical view these days. You had that uh, Michelle Wolf salute to abortion special where she compared having abortion to, to ordering fast food and did this kind of celebration of it. Abortion shouldn't be a luxury. It should be on the dollar menu at McDonald's. Hey, I'd like a large Diet Coke and can you get this egg out of my McMuffin? Abortion, I salute you! Women, if you need an abortion, get one! 
I know that's supposed to be funny, uh, but I don't find it funny, and, and I find it deeply disturbing that, that this kind of extremely unambiguous view is being pushed. So I don't want to, you know, come out, you know, rah-rah for the, for the pro-choice side uh, as much as I might have done once before, before it became quite so radical. On the other side, I'm not going to come out rah-rah on the anti-abortion side because I, I don't think it's murder. It's something different from murder, but it is taking a life and and it does have a, a moral ambiguity i think it would be nice if our country if our people adopted something like the the musical kuyo or some sort of ritual to to deal with abortion and to acknowledge the seriousness of it and the very gray ethical area that that we get into if if abortion becomes something that we are considering doing. One interesting part of the book was a quote that Lafleur picks out from someone named Takie Sugiyama Lebra. So it must be somebody who's uh, Japanese married to, to somebody who's non-Japanese, I assume, from that name. And the quote is, The Japanese are used to sayings like, even a thief may be 30% right. I never heard that, but that's an interesting quote, and it kind of is like a sort of like things I'd heard when I lived over there, although I hadn't heard that one exactly. And another one, to hold a grudge against others is not good, but to do something that arouses a grudge is just as bad. And in this uh, Lebra, uh, the person quoted says, the Japanese tend to hold everyone involved in a conflict responsible for it, while the Anglo-American compulsion for court trial determines one person guilty and the other person innocent. So I think in this case, it's hard to say. It's impossible, in fact, to, to give a, a definitive, this side is right and this side is wrong conclusion for these, for these problems. And... And this may be why they're so contentious for us, because I think deep down in our hearts of hearts, as Americans even, we know that these, this issue is ambiguous and we know that it can't be solved. It's one of these arguments that you could keep going on forever and never reach the end of it. And so people will, will just fight about it and, and take their sides and, and all to what end, I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to get involved in this, and, and I don't want to have my face plastered all over social media when somebody beats a drum in my in, you know, in front of me. So I'm kind of staying out of it as a debate, except what I just told you. And, and these are my opinions, and this is the kind of history and what I've learned from reading William Lafleur's book and, and other things. So if you liked what you saw, you can donate by PayPal and Patreon. Links are below, and that's how I make my living. Thank you. See you later. Have a fun day.